This is the Aptitude Outdoors podcast where we interview travelers, explorers, and outdoorsmen and women to bring you the best tips and stories from around the world. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Aptitude Outdoors podcast here on YouTube. If you can, before we get started here, go down below, hit that subscribe button, give me a hand there, I'd greatly appreciate it. Uh, Today we're continuing on with some of the podcasts I took while I was down in Texas at the Hunt Fish Podcast Summit, and today we're going to hear from an awesome guy that I met down there, Todd Craighead. He's the host of the TV show Outdoor Oklahoma. He's a really nice and awesome guy, and most importantly, he's very well versed in hunting, fishing, and the outdoors in general. I learned a ton from Todd. We have a really great conversation here. This podcast is a little shorter than some of the other ones I've put out in the past because we were just so anxious uh, to get out there and finish hunting and try and get some wild turkey. So let's dive right in to this awesome conversation. Todd, (laughs) we've uh, got to know each other a little bit over these last few days. Absolutely. Um, I appreciate your patience with me. (laughs) Todd and I have been blind buddies over here in Texas, and I've probably driven you nuts by just asking every question in the book. But I'm a curious man. I'm sorry. I can't help it. I mean, how else are you going to learn? I mean, I've I've loved it, though. And, And, you know, the greatest thing about being the one with more experience is that you make me feel smart. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, at least I'm good for something That's for once. Right. You know what I'm saying? Um, I'm, I, I would like to say, you know, I'm very impressed by how much you know. Because sometimes you ask people stuff and they're like, oh. <laughs> Especially when they ask me. I'm like, I have no idea. Right. But uh, you've taught me so much about turkey in the last three days. More than I've ever known about any animal, I think. It's just really impressive. And you have a lifetime of hunting. You have a lifetime of fishing. And you are a television show host, which is very impressive. I've, I've dabbled. And uh, as we've discussed, you know, maybe it's not for me. Uh, how did you get started in that field of, of television? You know, it uh, for... For your viewers and listeners that are not from Oklahoma, mm-hmm. uh, they're not familiar with me. I um, I have some uh, a birth defect that's a really rare birth defect called arthrogryposis multiplex congenita, and I'm going to quiz you on that later. Make uh, sure you uh, remember. Uh, Arthur. <laughs> yeah, Arthur. No. Uh, anyway, AMC. How's that? <laughs> uh, you're lucky. I remember your last name yeah, over yeah. more than a day. So. So AMC is a, a pretty rare. Uh, birth defect. Some varieties are as rare as one in a quarter of a million babies. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, every one of us literally pops out looking totally different. It affects each each individual differently. And uh, in my situation, I was very small when I was born, under four pounds, uh, was uh, Spent the first uh, over a year of my life in a body cast. Um, my uh, essentially the birth defect affects the development of muscles around your uh, certain joints, like your elbows or your ankles or your knees or your hands or whatever. And so I'm one of those that was affected in all four limbs, um, in arms, hands, legs, and feet. And uh, my my grandmother, my mother's mother, even told her, told my mother when I was born, uh, you know, Donna, you're going to have to take care of Todd his whole life. And then when you can't, you're going to have to make arrangements to put him in an institution. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, just didn't give her a lot of positive reinforcement yeah. that this is going to be okay. But my mother, who was very stubborn to a fault, you know, bowed up to her own mother and said, oh, no, he will not. You know, over my dead body, will he just, you know, have to be coddled and taken care of? And um, she spent her lifetime preparing me to be able to be uh, totally independent. And uh, and my dad as well was right there, just right in line with her, um, making sure that I experienced everything that every other kid experienced, had every opportunity that everyone did, and um, and made sure that uh, I wasn't going to have to rely on people for help. Uh, and um, so I, I had two phenomenal parents that really really provided that, um, you know, that foundation uh, for for uh, being able to be independent. But it's still, that's a still a far stretch to then come 53 years forward and I'm 
a host of a television show of a physical outdoor activity, <laughs> you know? I yeah. mean, I'm the least likely <laughs> yeah. person that you would, uh, you would, you know, Imagine you'd think you're you're going to put the big strapping, brawny, you know, chiseled, you know, all American male there representing this sport, uh, and um, uh, but here I am, you yeah. know, five seven and kind of pudgy and balding, <laughs> and I can't hear. I'm practically deaf now, and yet um, I'm I'm the one on the on the screen most weeks, and it's. Um, I, I really don't know exactly that I could just pinpoint one particular thing that uh, led to this. I know that speaking on behalf of um, the disabled community at large, I feel assured that I could say that we all, the driving thing at our core that all of us want more than anything is just to be treated as an equal. Yep. And, uh, you know, I, I spent time in braces and, and uh, corrective shoes and casts and a wheelchair for a while and uh, many different surgeries. And through all that, I mean, my, my biggest desire as a young person was just to, just to be like everybody, just to blend in. Mm -hmm. I mean, just to be able to walk or roll into a room and not everybody you know, their head on a swivel, spin and look at me. Yeah. Uh, just to blend in and be normal for one day. That's all I ever wanted. And um, so because of being different, people do treat you differently. Uh, there was a lot of that being uh, made an exception of uh, when I was in school, grade school. Oh, Todd doesn't quite have to do everything else that everybody else does because of mm -hmm. blah, blah, blah. Or uh, we'll make an exception to this thing or Todd doesn't quite have to finish this something, whatever it was. And um, I was coddled and made an exception of all those those very um, important years, you know, yeah. of a preteen. And I was just, I was just at my core wanting more than anything just to be treated as an equal. Mm -hmm. And uh, through some friends and through my parents, uh, I, I discovered the outdoors and that the outdoors doesn't care. Yeah. Who you are mm -hmm. or what background you have, it only lives in the moment and it treats everyone as an equal. The outdoors is the great equalizer. Oh, yeah. And so I found out that, hey, if I'm going to go out on a squirrel hunt, I'm going to be dealing with the, all the exact same issues and elements that every other squirrel hunter is going to be dealing with. And for once in my life, I was... I was not made an exception of. The outdoors didn't make it any easier on me mm -hmm. because I was different. And so I just soaked that up like a sponge. And I craved that and I found that in the outdoors. And it just led from one thing to another, a squirrel hunt to rabbit hunting to, uh, to eventually deer hunting, turkey, predator calling. I, I just, um, I can't get enough of it. <laughs> yeah, your, your calling is great. You have... You've introduced me to more calls in the last three days than I've ever heard in my whole life. You've got the, you've had the the, the owl call. Yeah. You have the, was the crow call. You yeah. have the turkey calls. Sure. Uh, different types of each call. Right. Um, yeah. That that is super important. I think a lot of people, a lot of people don't know this. My day job, I work with uh, for a, dis a place the friends called Friends for Life. Uh -huh. Yeah. Residential care and and it's people with disabilities. They take care of people disabilities. I'm the media guy. I do their podcasts, all that stuff. And we, we hear that so much. It's like the, the most thing that everybody says when they come on the show is I just want to do normal shit that people do. I yeah. want to do normal stuff. I don't want everybody to hold my hand. Like I can yeah. do it. It might take longer. It might be. Yeah. And the best point you made is the great equalizer the outdoor i think <laughs> i think part of the reason that we're all here for this podcast convention is we all really must have an urge to just be anguish and pain and hurt ourselves <laughs> because that's that's what hunting is we get up early we stay up late we hang out we're pot, we're doing all this cool stuff yeah and you you have to absolutely love the outdoors to make that happen um i found the same thing it's like every time i do something that i thought i couldn't do that becomes the next 
next sure. level. Like, I can't climb that mountain. Then I climb that mountain. I'm like, oh, well, there's a bigger mountain over there. That'll be way <laughs> harder. And yeah, that's absolutely that's absolutely awesome. So you, you've you been the host of Oklahoma Outdoors for, what, you said 25 years now? I've been, yes. I worked for the Department of Wildlife for 25 years, been involved with the show for that whole time, but I've been the actual host for, uh, I, I can't really pinpoint it, but over 20 years now. Wow. Uh, and, um, yeah, that's, that was one of those things of just being in the right place at the right time. I, mm-hmm. I went to school and got a degree in wildlife ecology and then, um, uh, with an emphasis in communications in, in journalism, I was originally hired, uh, in 1995 to, um, uh, be their publications, print publications mm-hmm. specialist, did a lot of desktop publishing, you know, uh, design and layout and writing and photography. Um, and soon after starting, then um, just, you know, got the opportunity to kind of substitute for the host at that time. Mm-hmm. And then the show was ready for a bit of a transition. And uh, I was asked if I was interested and sure, yeah. why not? Uh, and, uh, man, I've just never looked back. It has opened so many doors to so many great friendships, opportunities, and experiences that I just, I can't imagine doing anything different. Yeah. And I, I I was the kid that grew up. I just loved the nature shows, the PBS, which you guys are, you said PBS, right? Yeah. Uh So yeah, you're, you're, you're airing on PBS. And the great thing that I love about PBS is they will do documentaries from all over the world, but they also work locally and i think mm-hmm. that's super important because like the the word nature people just assume you're being outside in a park or out the outdoors whatever but there's so many regionally and state local separations mm-hmm. like i'm 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 in here in texas from ohio and this is like be, you might as well drop me on mars there's <laughs> i couldn't name a tree i couldn't name a flower there's i can literally see cactus right now and it, it's so awesome so i think that's really important um and i'm based all, all my listenerships mostly out of ohio I, I would assume i have no idea to be completely honest right. but uh What's what are some of the, your favorite parts of Oklahoma? Because I have absolutely zero percent experience. Well, there. you, you got to come now, especially since to. we've been blind buddies. <laughs> yeah, now. yeah. Uh, you've got to come experience Oklahoma just to get on my little soapbox and give a plug for my Please. home state. We are one of the most eco diverse um, uh, states in the entire country. Mm-hmm. Uh, just just from a uh, biomes perspective or ecoregion perspective, we have seven distinct different ecoregions within Oklahoma. We have, as far as wildlife, everything, literally everything from Rocky Mountain bighorn sheep to alligators. Only two states in the country can claim that. Texas, which that's not really fair because they're (laughs) 10 times bigger than everybody else, and Oklahoma. Everything from, I mean, bighorn sheep, elk, antelope, all those really, um, you know, popular big game species, uh, mule deer, white-tailed deer, and then um, turkeys. We've got three subspecies of turkeys. There's only five, if you don't count um, the... Uh, the one in uh, Central America, but five in North America. Uh, and we have three of them. You yeah. know, there's not, I mean, there might be one or two other states, you know, possibly Kansas, possibly Texas, probably that can claim that. And um, and those are not, um, those are natural. I mean, those are, those are not stocked populations. Uh, and then clear down in the Southeast part of the state, alligators and and cypress swamps that you would typically think of, of uh, you know, um, Alabama and, and Louisiana. Um, mountain ranges, we've got some of the oldest mountain ranges on earth, uh, the Arbuckle Mountains. And you, you say, well, how can that be? Because they're not very big and I've never heard of them. Well, the older a mountain range is, the more worn down it is. So they're, you know, compared to Rocky Mountains or Himalayans or whatever, they're nothing. Yeah. But they are ecologically the some of the oldest mountains in, on earth. Uh, some of the most incredible breathtaking views are in southwest Oklahoma, in the Wichita Mountains, Ozark Plateau, in the northeast. I could just go on and on. <laughs> well, and, and I feel like there's a, there's a similarity here between sort of Oklahoma and Ohio, as in 
and, and maybe even states like Nebraska or something, because mm-hmm. you just everyone would consider that like a flyover. Like, eh, yeah, whatever. Who cares? Yeah. Like, who cares about Ohio? Who cares sure. about Oklahoma? But it's everywhere you go, especially in the United States. There's just a hidden world of the outdoors. Not everywhere is Texas. Not yeah. everywhere is Maine. Not everywhere is the West Coast, yeah. uh, Colorado, all, uh, all the amazing stuff that half of our guests are obsessed with are right. here. You know, So it's like, I'm big. This whole show started because I, I kind of am the punching bag for the average guy. Like, I started from nothing. I don't know. I don't know jack shit about hunting. I'm, I'm learning still. I don't, you know, I, I don't have that naturalist background, but I'm like obsessed with the outdoors. And people like you have spent your lifetime promoting your own home state. And I think that's really important because a lot of, a lot of what goes on, like it, all of most of our conversation here, and this, I'm not talking bad about the, the, the anybody because the, 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 like out West is amazing. I would love to go to Colorado and shoot elk or, or, yeah. or just go hike in the Rockies. But a, a lot of us can't, a lot of us yeah. have to deal with our, I don't want to say deal with, have live where we are and we want to embrace sure. that, that wilderness area. And I think there's just this conception of like, it's not fun unless you go to Colorado mm-hmm. or Washington. And I, I'm, I'm really glad that you plug that. Uh, what, what's some of your favorite, um, stuff that you've done on the TV show. There's always got to be a stand You know, there's there's several that uh, really stick out in my mind as being just benchmark, you know, experiences or things that I'll never forget. Um, I did a show uh, several years ago, maybe six, seven years ago now, with uh, a little girl that her, her grandmother reached out to me and said, hey, by any chance, we, we watch you on TV, do you have AMC? And yeah, and she said, uh, well, so does my granddaughter and she lives, you know, 30 miles from me. Mm-hmm. It was, I was in my 30s before I ever even met someone else with AMC. Wow. And here this little girl, her name is Ryan, um, who's not so little anymore. She's going to turn 13 <laughs> this summer. And, um, and so I made a point to connect with that family. And we did a show with Ryan and I going fishing. And, and me interviewing her mother uh, and just talking about the similarities in our, uh, you know, our backgrounds and, and Ryan loves the outdoors. And uh, I, my other obsession, it's somewhat related to the outdoors, are Jeeps. Mm-hmm. I've got a 41-year-old Jeep named Stickers. <laughs> And uh, we'll get into that a little bit. Yeah. But um, yeah, w- I've taken Ryan and her sister and her mother on on Jeep trips just on the side for fun. And that that is a family that will forever be a part of my life. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it started from the connection that the TV show provided. Um, and then there's there no there's those ones that are special because they were total screw ups, <laughs> you know, just <laughs> that's total my whole show <laughs> disasters. Uh, there's the turkey hunt that I did early on in my career, and I'm zoomed in close on this turkey, full frame. I give the signal to the hunter, go ahead, shoot, boom, he shoots, and and I t- I I look up, and I I start panning out on the camera, and I go, oh, you missed. <laughs> no, he goes, no, I didn't miss. He was shooting a different bird than I was videoing. <laughs> In my inexperience, I didn't communicate that with him yeah, at the last yeah. minute. Which bird are you on, you know? <laughs> and so I totally missed that one. Uh, there's the ones where you've, you've done, you do camera work all the time, and you double tap the shutter, mm-hmm. and you think you're recording, but you just turned it on and off. Yep. And then the most amazing action happens. You mm-hmm. know, the eagle flies into the nest, and the eaglets come up, and it feeds it a fish. And you look down, you weren't even recording. <laughs> that has happened more uh, times than I want to admit. Yeah, those those are, are uh, unfortunately stuck in my memory as well. But, um, you know, it's it's the people that will forever, you know, be a part of my life and, and what I remember the most. Um, the, you know, I did recently a show with three, it was a deer hunt, three generations, grandfather, father, grandson, the grandfather and father are, are both brigadier generals. Wow. And, uh, and I'm sharing, you know, a blind one at a time with these guys and they're telling their stories of, um, Iraqi freedom and desert storm. And 
I mean, I'm just overwhelmed, you know, with gratitude and emotion that I got to be a part of those uh, people's lives just for a little bit. Uh, and, uh, and then there's sometimes every once in a while, there's the chance to be around a big name, you know, mm -hmm. a celebrity that it just, you know, makes me, uh, you know, get starstruck and just start stuttering and saying dumb stuff. Uh, <laughs> I've got to interview Ted Nugent and, uh, in the middle or before that interview even started, I looked down and the, uh, wireless mic pack that I put on him the batteries were dead. And I mean, I was so embarrassed and I didn't even take extra batteries. There was a crowd that had gathered at this sports show that we were at. And so Ted said, no problem. He just started announcing to the crowd that was in the background watching, who's got double A's? And everybody's, you know, every redneck in that place was digging for double A's. I want to, you know, please use my yeah. double A's. Uh, and, um, then um, uh, our different governors in Oklahoma, lieutenant governors, had great relationships with them. Blake Shelton, you may have heard of him. Yeah, you know. I think so. <laughs> uh, uh, we've had a great working relationship with him since, you know, early on in his career. And uh, we've uh, done several shows with him. Um, and uh, the funny story with him, when I was on a boat in... Um, middle of Lake Texoma, one of our, the biggest lake in Oklahoma, borders Oklahoma and Texas. And uh, it's one of the greatest uh, inland uh, striper fisheries in the world. And so that's what it's most famous for. We take Blake Shelton fishing. I'm in a camera boat next to his, and I want him to do a little stand-up promo uh, tease for the show. I said, hey, Blake, hold up two of the, the biggest stripers there, you know, hold them up and, and look right at me at the camera and say, hey, y'all, I'm Blake Sheldon. Welcome to, you know, Outdoor Oklahoma. We're going to be watching or doing some striper fishing on Texoma today, you know. So he goes, I, I say, you got it? He goes, yeah, I'm ready. You ready? Yeah. And so he holds up the fish and he goes, hey, y'all, I'm Blake Sheldon. Check out these MFers. <laughs> Now that's how you start a show. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, I couldn't use it. Everybody's laughing. You know, there's probably eight people between his boat and my boat, and we're all dying laughing. And I said, you've got to do that again. He goes, nope, that's all you get. <laughs> Deal with it. I like that. Uh, but, uh, yeah, those those guys are a lot of fun, too. Um, and local folks that um, are have been made it big in, in the outdoor industry, like um, uh, Jimmy Houston uh, is from Oklahoma um, and uh, got a great working relationship with him, been around him several times and, and others. And it's there's just so many highlights, you know, I can't name them all. Oh, yeah, of course. But so in, uh, in Oklahoma, every state has, you know, experience awesome wildlife in it so you you you've hunted you fished a lot what's what's a species of either either you know land animal or fish what's something that's like kind of like a hidden hidden gem that maybe everybody doesn't know about that you'd be like this is what you when you come here you should probably do this you know um i don't know that oklahoma is ha, holds the corner of the market on this but the most recent thing that i've become most passionate about is predator hunting and I don't know what it is about it that is so appealing, but I have just really got into it. I, I've been doing it for maybe 15 years, but mm -hmm. every year I up the game with, with new stuff and new challenges and learn more every year. And I mean, that is just, uh, if you haven't tried coyote hunting or bobcat hunting, there man, that is such a rush. Uh, it is such a challenge. So many things you've got to be, a, uh, you've got to strategize for. Mm -hmm. And when you have a busted hunt, nothing comes in. I, I'm, when I'm walking back to the truck or driving to the next spot, I'm over analyzing every single thing that I did at that hunt and trying to figure out why a critter didn't come in. And uh, it's, you know, you've had some, a taste of turkey hunting now. Oh, yeah. A lot of that same strategy applies. However, now you've got scent to worry about, you know, mm. because turkey can't smell. So yep. thankfully, if they, I told you in the blind, I think yeah. that if they ever learn to smell, I'll never be able to kill another <laughs> one because 
uh, the, it's, you've just got so many things going against you. There's, oh, there's, there. what, it, yeah, sorry. There, there's literally a deer just drinking. Yeah. I don't know what that is. I don't That's know a the, black buck from India. Black buck from India. There's literally, like, we're outside in Texas right now. So for the people that can't see it on a, on video, but yeah, yeah there is literally a black buck, which I don't even know what that is, but <laughs> yeah, they, you get, they have some wild exotic animals down here. Um, but yeah, he just walked up drinking out of a big, uh, pond or a big cooler, whatever that thing is. I don't know. Feeder Trough. tank. Trough. <laughs> yeah. See, I told you, I don't know anything. I, you thought I was kidding, but yeah. You've seen gun smoke, surely. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it, uh, this place is awesome, but yeah, sorry to, <laughs> sorry to interrupt predator hunting. Yeah. I mean, there's just, that is so much fun and relatively speaking compared to other, you know, big game hunting, um, all across the country, that's an untapped, uh, opportunity that a lot of people are probably missing out on. And the cool thing about it in most States, now there's some exceptions, most States it's the regulations are very liberal. You can hunt, mm -hmm. uh, in my state, you can hunt year round. Um, you just have to have a hunting license yep. uh, if you're going to hunt for um, for coyotes. Now, bobcats are a internationally um, regulated species. Uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service in the United States regulates and manages for them. So states have to have seasons, and there's much uh, a lot more regulation behind that. Uh, for bobcats, but um, for coyotes, you can hunt them year round. There's no limit in Oklahoma. There's no uh, restrictions on what types of method of take, you know, caliber of gun or use a bow or shotgun, whatever you want. Uh, and um, there's there's uh, some, some biologists that are kind of arguing this fact now, but for the most part, you're, if you're a deer hunter, if you're a quail hunter, if you're a pheasant hunter, a turkey hunter, you are helping your resource out there too by helping to reduce the number of predators. However, there is some research that shows that hunting coyotes in particular actually can increase their their population density in any one given area. That, yeah. uh, so, I mean, but I still feel like I'm, I'm, um, you know, my buddy called me the other, or texted me the other day, uh, and said, I just shot two coyotes, two fawn killers are out yeah. of the system. And, uh, um, yeah, I mean, yeah, they do eat other animals. They're a predator, but that is such an awesome, uh, thrill to be able to defeat, you know, an apex predator you know, in its own environment and defeat all his senses. That's, that's quite an accomplishment. Yeah. I've, I've never done predator hunting. Um, but I've, I've, everybody that I know that is into it really says it's a, it's a thrill. And, you know, for people that don't, the, there's an argument there about, I don't, I don't like to argue about hunting at all because I think it's futile. Like, I don't, sure. I don't think it has any, any like bearing because like for me, I have an anthropology degree. So I, I like, I, I, un, I like look at any time of a human perspective, I'm always looking back. I'm always yeah. thinking to myself and like the, the, the perception of hunting, I don't know, I don't know how, how it is across the U.S., but where I'm from, People think hunting, they think drunk, rednecks, beer, you know, dudes out there wanting to blow stuff up and kill stuff. And every person I've ever met that has coached me or mentored me or helped me with hunting has never been like that. Yeah. Ever. I mean, there are people like that. Yeah. And it's one of those scenarios that one bad apple ruins it for the rest of the class kind of exactly. thing. And every person here, every person I've ever interviewed about hunting is more of a conservationist than any person I've ever met who has not hunted. <laughs> and I, I just I just think it gets such a bad rap. And it's unfair because it is the hardest thing I've ever done. I've hiked thousands <laughs> of miles. I have, you know, I've kayaked hundreds of miles. I have done long distance stuff. I've filmed solo in crazy mountains and stuff. Like, uh, and 
this is the hardest thing I've ever done. We probably spent a cumulative between everybody here, what, 50, 60, 70 hours in the ground hunting sure. in yeah. the last three days. And we're all been skunked. Yes. <laughs> and Why would you have to point that out? You know, but... Because I like to, I told you, I'm the punching bag yeah. for, for outdoors. And uh, <laughs> as there's literally a black buck, like yeah, right 70 there. yard, face 50 <laughs> yards away from us. But um, turkeys, let's, let's talk turkeys a little bit. They are mischievous yeah. frustrating oh yeah hellions absolutely they will toy with you and uh it is so frustrating but uh, like i mentioned when i was talking about predator hunting i i like to learn from my own mistakes mm-hmm. learn from other people's mistakes and learn and from my successes as well and so you know when i've uh, every hunt that i walk back to the truck uh from i i think about what were the conditions that didn't make that happen? Or if I'm lucky enough and I'm toting, I'm coming out heavy and I'm toting a bird on my back, I think about what may, that wasn't just a fluke. You know, what did I do right that time? Yeah. And how can I repeat that? But turkeys um, just um, don't get near the respect, you know, from the non-hunting or anti-hunting communities. Oh. Hunters have a lot of respect for turkeys, but I think most people think, oh, it's that bird that you get for Thanksgiving dinner Mm -hmm. and uh, they're dumb as a brick or there's that old, it's not really a wives tale, but it's, it's exaggerated of, oh, well, turkeys, when it's raining, they'll stand out in the rain with their looking up with their mouth open and then drown. Someone yeah. literally said that before I left for this trip. Yeah. Like how are, are you're going to go shoot turkeys? They stand and they drown. I was like, yeah, I don't they stand. Uh, yeah. Well, <laughs> you know, I mean, those could be domestic yeah. birds that I, who knows, but a wild turkey is one of the smartest and wariest critters out there. Yeah. And to defeat him at his own game, because when it comes down to it, I, we talked about this in the blind too, um, you know, the natural, uh, the, the natural order of, of what happens in the spring is that the tom is the showier of the two mm-hmm. of the sexes. And he's the one that is putting on the display, gobbling, calling hens to him. And then those hens that are willing uh, and interested will come to him. So when we hear that gobble out there, uh, that tom is expectant of a hen to come to him. Mm-hmm. He's letting Tom's or hens know I'm out here and I'm available if you want to get down, you know, so uh, come over here. And but we can't as hunters walk up to them. Yeah. They have incredible eyesight, incredible hearing. Uh, Found that out earlier. Yeah. So so we're having to buck their instinct and buck buck what they're used to. And that is we're trying to convince him that we are so attractive we are so much what he wants that he has to break tradition and come to us. Mm-hmm. In the wild, that's not how it happens. And so that you've already, from you know, from the get-go, got an uphill challenge to uh, convince a turkey to to um, to uh, break from his instinct. Yeah. Uh, and um, the younger the bird is, typically the easier that is to convince him. Mm-hmm. Um, the older that bird is, and I feel very certain where we've been playing cat and mouse with a at least a three-year-old bird, maybe a four-year-old bird that has been called to and hunted a yeah. lot this season already. And uh, I don't know. I mean, I don't know if we can get that bird killed this afternoon. I'm hoping we can, but that one that we roosted, put to roost last night and then um, the one that you saw personally last night, if... Those are two separate birds, but they're in the same draw. Those those know what's going on, and uh, it's it's very hard. I mean, to sound like a hen, to act like a hen enough to convince him to come to you, uh, that's an uphill battle. Well, let's uh, let's talk a little bit of strategy. I mean, before we do that, well, yesterday when we 
left the blind finally and started stalking and they literally that ridge that's across the way from where yeah, we're sitting right now exactly. we uh we were, we were stalking them that is the most fun i've had in so long <laughs> i just feel like a badass i don't know how way, other yeah. way to explain it well, so you got a gun and yeah. you're in camo what's not badass yeah about exactly that? <laughs> i feel like i feel like i should be on have like my own hunting show yeah there. yeah i have no idea what i'm doing but are i could look the good part. side yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh we're, we're here on the last day of hunting we're all leaving tomorrow uh uh, what, what's going to give us our best shot, you think, in your expert opinion? You know, uh, like I said before, these birds on this ranch have been hunted to. Uh, the ranch owner told us that there's been birds killed off that ridge right there where we've been hunting already this season. Um, I don't know. I've tried several of the bag of tricks, you know, things in my bag of tricks already. I've tried using a decoy and not calling uh, at all, just hoping that I end up being where he's traveling through and sees me and comes to the hen. Okay. Uh, I've, I tried that this morning. I didn't call hardly at all. Uh, put the decoy out in an area that seemed like a, a, a likely afternoon loafing area. Sometimes they're called strut zones for a, a tom. Uh, and um, I didn't ever call a single time. Sat there for two hours or something and um, never heard a gobble, never saw one come through and I had pretty good visibility. I've I've tried not using a decoy and calling a bunch. Uh, we have tried to uh, be very proactive, hear a gobble and then go towards it and push our luck and see how close we can get. We did that last night. And, uh, and then after I split off, that was another strategy. I left you there. I started working my way back up the ridge, calling every once in a while, hoping to convince him that I was a hen that was leaving, that he's, he needs to come get and come fetch. And so I was hoping I'd just pull him up by you, even if he never gobbled again. And that didn't work. Um, so I've, I'm not out of my little bag of tricks, but... Um, uh, you know, I've got to sit and think about what's our best bet. Uh, you know, to a bird that's been hunted a lot, possibly on public land, for say, for instance, um, it's uh, general. The general rule of thumb is call as little as you feel like you can get away with, mm -hmm. uh, and call softly, because most beginning hunters love to use the turkey woods to practice they're calling and they'll just call constantly and they think you know uh gosh or even if they've got a bird gobbling at them and i was tempted with this um that first day that first afternoon we were here we had a bird gobbling and uh i was probably calling too much but you there is that sense of desperation to feel in control of the situation so the hunter calls, he gobbles. Good. Oh no, 30 seconds has passed. He hasn't gobbled. Where is he? Has he forgot about me? I better call again. No, it's like I a mean, desperate date. Yeah. So I use almost exclusively a box call, uh, which is my favorite kind of call and what I feel like I sound the best at. And you have so, an interesting box call. Yeah, I How love that thing. I, um, you know, I keep a rubber band around it when it's in my vest so it doesn't squeak when I'm squawk when I'm walking around. Mm -hmm. And so I have a little discipline that I do. I'll I'll use the call, I'll do a series of calls, then you know, many guys will just lay the call down on their lap or on their leg or right beside them or something. No, I put the rubber band back on it and put it in my pocket. I don't know if you ever really noticed yep, I that. Did. I was like, why and are you doing that? <laughs> so that I'm not tempted to pick it up mm -hmm. and call too often, you know? And so that's my own little self-discipline. Yeah. I put it up so that I don't just sit there with it in my hand and think, oh no, that's it's been a whole minute. You know, I better call again. And I, I put it completely away, and that's just my my practice to make sure I don't call too much. And I still overcall, um, but um, so you can't help it almost. You're so I excited. I know that call you mentioned. <laughs> I've been hunting with for um, 22 years now. Uh, Dick Kirby, who has since passed away, was the founder of Quaker Boy Turkey Calls, one of the um, godfathers of the call turkey calling industry mm -hmm. uh 
Uh, and um, I got the very rare and fortunate opportunity to interview him when he came to Oklahoma for a hunt. I'm going to get the statistic wrong. I don't know it right off the top of my head, but it blew me out of the water. He was probably in his 60s 22 years ago, and he was from New York. That's where the company was based. He would go on the road every spring and um, and uh, c- accomplish the Grand Slam, North American Grand Slam, get all five species every single year on the road hunting out of his minivan and uh, and you know he developed relationships with outfitters you know in Florida for the Osceola and mm-hmm. you know wherever else and he hadn't got an Oklahoma Rio so he worked with a ranch that I knew in Oklahoma and got an invitation and uh, and then he you know he spent like a day and a half hardcore hunting Rios in Oklahoma and then left as soon as he got his bird jumped in his minivan and went to Colorado for his Merriams and uh, <coughs> he was just a beast and yeah. um, oh I just had so much respect and was in such awe of him back then and uh, to thank me he um, he gave me a, a mini paddle boat M-I-N-I mini paddle boat box call uh, and uh, and signed it uh, custom crafted Todd, for Todd Craighead, your friend, uh, uh, Dick Kirby, uh, 1999, awesome. and then drew this little picture of a turkey on it. And I mean, I, golly, I was just, I mean, he was already one of my, you know, industry idols, you know, and then he gave me this call and drew on it. And so I just started using it, uh, nonstop. And, um, I, I don't know where I picked this idea up, but, Across the spine on the bottom of the call, I started writing just a couple statistics of every call of every turkey that I harvested, calling that bird in, and um, I've just about run out of room on that I, box it's call. Full. It's all over it, and uh, and some of the best hunting buddies, uh, some of the best turkey callers that I've ever been around uh, are on that are represented on that box call. Um, and, uh, you know, with the year, the, the state, the county, uh, and, um, and it's one of my, my most treasured, you know, prized possessions just because it's full of and represents so many memories. Well, I'm, I'm absolutely tickled pink right now because I just got one of those. Uh, I won by miraculous. I've, ne- I've told <laughs> everybody in that we had a, a round table earlier. Uh-huh. We all, everybody here, we talked and, and discussed outdoors issues and, and I won the custom uh, call, slate yeah. call. Yeah. I, I've, I was telling everyone, I've never won anything in my life. I've entered, <laughs> I've actually stopped entering raffles like a two year or two ago because I have yeah. never ever won. And this well, is going to be set that the call. You're bar high for yourself because right. uh, that thing is beautiful. I know. Well, you custom know. made by a donor that was, you know, a sponsor of this event. A friend of uh, Derek's. Yes. And that thing, I am so freaking jealous because that is beautiful. Wow. I hope you understand what a great thing that is. I, that, tr- I, I trust yeah. me. I went to the store and looked at these, and I am, I yeah. am, I don't I, ever sell that. Or I will never, I will never sell butt. that. This is, this is <laughs> going to become what you have. That's I'm great. stealing your idea. Sorry. That's great. But, um, you yeah. put little hashtags on yeah, it or something yeah. for every turkey. Well, I'm hoping to add one today. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Wouldn't that be awesome? But, um, <laughs> speaking of which, I usually go for an hour, but we're, we're carrying a day, daylight here on this last day. And I yeah. really want to get out there and, and get our last, last few hours of hunting in. So I, a, I want to thank you so much for putting up with me <laughs> for the last few days. They kind of just dropped us off together, and you got stuck with me. So <laughs> no, I, it's it's been a pleasure, yeah. and I that's one of the simple pleasures in life is is seeing someone else become passionate about something that you're so passionate about. So I mean, I need to be thanking you for oh, no. uh, breathing a new breath of fresh air into my hunting hunting life. <laughs> well, on that note, Todd, let's hop in this little gator or whatever these damn things are Ranger, called. Ranger, Ranger, gator, cart thing and head out and get a turkey. Let's get a turkey. That's good. Let's All right. Do it. Thank you. <laughs> 
Hey everybody, thanks for watching this episode of the Aptitude Outdoors podcast here on YouTube. If you can, help me out, go down below, hit that subscribe button. Really want to take a moment here to say thanks to Todd for coming on the show and talking about, you know, his history with you know, hunting, fishing, the outdoors, his television show, his disability, and just being really open and honest about everything, whether it's predator hunting, regular hunting, fishing, and sharing some really hilarious stories. So thanks, Todd. If you guys want to learn more, you can follow Todd on Instagram. He's always posting the coolest stuff. I'm always super jealous of what he's doing. And before we go, I want to take a minute here to give a shout out to everyone who sponsored the event because it wouldn't be able to head down there without them. So thank you all so much. Let's get a quick word from our sponsors. All right, first up for the sponsors, we have Chicken Boy Lures, who arguably have one of the most hilarious backstories I've ever seen in my entire life. If you want to check that out, you can head over to their website, which is chickenboylures.com. They have plenty of proven baits to choose from, including the Whippin' Chicken, the Bubba Clucker, the Psycho Chicken, and the world-famous chicken shit butt sauce check out chicken boy lures up next we have captain experiences who you'll be hearing from later on another episode of the podcast where adventurers are able to search captain experiences.com to find charter fishing trips that meet their criteria compare and contrast them book within seconds and show up to the dock with a great understanding of who they're meeting what they'll be doing and guides can focus on fishing knowing that captain experiences will take care of the rest and last but not least there's saltwater recon by utilizing the latest technology in live high definition interactive webcams saltwaterrecon.com is the no before you go resource for millions of people whether boating fishing or observing real-time coastal conditions saltwaterrecon.com's array of hd cameras combined with expert boating fishing and weather content will give visitors the information needed to plan a safe and successful day on the water and right before we go i really want to thank the double draw ranch for hosting us spot stalker guide service which is owned by Derek york of impact outdoors uh definitely check them out awesome guide service hopefully be able to get down there myself and do some fishing with Derek here in the future uh, i want to thank the vanessa house beer company for donating beer and seven day addiction and metro emergency upfitters so thank you all the sponsors and with that i'll see you guys here soon with another episode of the podcast peace <laughs>